Cave Story is definitely one of my favourite games of all time. As someone who really likes 2D platformer games, it ticked all the boxes for me. It had tight controls, a creative setting, a captivating plot, and was a serious challenge to beat without ever feeling like it was unfair. And believe it or not, Cave Story was developed, written, illustrated, and composed over the course of five years by just one guy, Daisuke Amaya, better known as Pixel. Despite how much I love Cave Story, it wasn't until very recently that I got around to playing Pixel's latest title, Kero Blaster. It's been out since 2014, so there's really no excuse for that, but now that I've finally gotten around to playing it, I figured I might as well make a review of it. The question on the minds of anyone who's ever played Cave Story is going to be, did this game live up to its predecessor? In a lot of ways, yeah. Let's get into it and have a look. The game begins with your player character, a worker at Cat and Frog Incorporated, being called into work by the president of the company. She talks at you for a bit in an incomprehensible alien language, as bosses do, and then sends you off to work. Officially, we're to believe our job is in custodial sciences, but a more accurate job description would be going to alien planets and committing genocide against the native fauna. Armed with a short-range rapid-fire blaster, your goal is to shoot your way through to the end of the game's levels and defeat the boss at the end. You never run out of ammo or need to recharge your gun. The only real reason to take your finger off the fire button is to change the direction you're facing. As long as you keep on firing, you'll stay facing the same way, which is good if you want to backpedal away from enemies while you're shooting at them. The game keeps things really simple with its controls. Aside from the directional buttons, you only have four buttons, one for shooting and one for jumping, and another two for swapping weapons. You can also hold up to fire upward, though you can't shoot downward as you could in Cave Story. Carrow Blaster's approach to gameplay is overall a lot more linear and simplified compared to Cave Story, which features a lot more jumping around and firing in different directions. This makes sense when you consider that Carrow Blaster is designed to be playable on mobile devices, but the style works really well on PC too and plays comfortably on a keyboard or a controller. The gameplay might be simple, but it's definitely not easy. I died multiple times on the first level alone. As a matter of fact, there wasn't a single level in the game that I passed without cocking up a few times. Thankfully the game has mechanics in place to balance out the difficulty. By defeating enemies or opening chests, you can find coins which can be spent in the shop. There's one shop hidden in each level, usually about halfway through. There you can buy upgrades to your health gauge and weapons, as well as one-ups and heart jars, which are one-use items that activate when your health reaches zero, saving you from death and refilling some of your health. You don't lose any of your coins on death, so if you're struggling on a level and keep dying, you'll end up accumulating more and more coins until you get to the point where you can afford to upgrade your health or weapon. So even if you're a little rusty like me, getting through the levels is totally doable even if it takes a bit longer. I found this to be a really intuitive way of keeping the game challenging for skilled players while offering some help to people who have a bit more trouble with it, without holding your hand or making things too easy. This mechanic actually works really well. I may have got a game over on my first attempt at the first level, but the second time around I'd upgraded my weapon and armor a bit and was able to beat it more easily. Every level in the game ends with a unique boss fight. Each one has its own attack patterns and needs you to use a different strategy to defeat it. Every one of these is really challenging and most of them took me several attempts to beat. You know a boss fight is good when it gets your heart racing yet doesn't feel unfair or broken, and that's the feeling I got from Kero Blaster's boss battles. After beating each boss, you unlock a new weapon or power-up. The game has four main weapons, the default blaster, a fan blaster, a bubble gun, and a flamethrower. Each of these can be upgraded twice, except the default, which can be upgraded three times. You can switch between the weapons you have at any time by using the two weapon swap buttons. While I ended up using the default blaster for most of the game, the other guns all have their uses too. The fan blaster fires bigger projectiles, making it easier to hit enemies. The bubble gun shoots bubbles that bounce along the ground so you can hit targets beneath you, and the flamethrower shoots fire that can damage certain enemies and obstacles that are immune to the other weapons. Early on in the game, you'll also get the jetpack, which lets you perform a double jump. If you double jump while moving left or right, you'll get a boost in that direction, but at the expense of some vertical height. For the highest jump possible, you'll have to stop moving and double jump from a complete standstill. The controls for the jetpack took a bit of getting used to, but it felt more natural the more I used it. In addition to the main boss battles at the end of each level, as you progress in the game you'll also start to encounter mini-bosses that pop up partway through the levels. These tend to be a bit easier than the big boss fights, and to make things even easier, if you beat them once and then get a game over after that, you won't need to fight them again, you can just walk right on past their arenas and get on with the level. There's even one mini-boss that you can skip entirely if you can cross the pit it lives in without falling into it. You do get a few coins for beating it though, 
though, if you're so inclined. One thing I really liked about Kero Blaster was the learning process that goes into playing it. Every time you discover a new boss fight, or even just a new regular enemy, the key to learning how to beat it is to recognize its attack patterns and learn how to counter them. You're likely to get hit a few times when you encounter an enemy you haven't seen before just because you don't understand its unique attack patterns yet. But once you've figured those out, you can start tearing through the fuckers like they're nothing. And that's a great feeling, and you earned it by using your brain, so you can go ahead and pat yourself on the back for being so fucking smart. I love the bizarre creativity that's gone into everything in this game. The bosses and enemies are just so inventive and unique. I mean, sure you might expect a spider crawling on the ceiling to drop down when you get close, but did you expect it to start breathing fire? And look at this enemy, it's a refrigerator that vomits snow. And what the fuck is this thing? It's a big old running clock with legs and a scarf and boots, and it's got a little pink bird on its head and gears orbiting around it, and now it's firing little pink birds and alarm clocks at me. Nothing about this makes sense, and I love it. The choice of level motifs is pretty creative too. You go from a fort, to a swamp, to a hotel, to a laboratory, in just the first four levels of the game. The actual design of the levels is very well done too. The enemy placement is intuitive, and all the levels have good flow and are comfortable to play through. Aside from one or two bullshit moments, everything's pretty much spot on. There's also a few secret passages with hidden treasure you can spot with a sharp eye. Normally this just means a few tiles that you can walk through to find some extra coins. The game's visuals are done in a low resolution retro style, much like Pixel's other works. Although the graphics are low res, the game actually plays and renders in a higher resolution, so everything feels really smooth as a modern game should. The scenery, backgrounds, items and enemies are all beautifully detailed and make great use of colour. In spite of the simplicity of the art style, everything just manages to look really good, while still keeping the focus on the gameplay. Keeping with the retro pixel aesthetic, the music is done in a suitable chiptune style. As you'd expect from a 2D platformer of this quality, every level has its own theme music which fits the mood and enhances the overall experience. The sound effects are all satisfying and appropriate too, everything sounds like it should, and between the sound effects and the music, this game is really easy on the ears. Much like Cave Story, every aspect of this game's design hit the nail on the head, and I can't really think of much to complain about, even if I wanted to. The base game is relatively short, in the sense that there are only 7 levels. If you're anything like me, a lot of the length comes from having to repeat the levels after getting a game over. This game was such a delight to play through that I never got seriously annoyed at having to do this. Once you've finished all seven levels and finished the game, the fun's still not over yet. Oh no. Start a new game after clearing the main story, and the game will ask you if you want to try Zangyo mode. This lets you replay the whole game with new level layouts, more difficult enemies and bosses, and a completely different plot. I didn't make a point of beating Zangyo mode for this review, considering how much time I spent just trying to beat normal mode, but based on what I did play of it, I'm really, really impressed. The level layouts are totally different from the main game, to the point where it nearly feels like I'm having a completely different experience. I'll definitely be going back after this review is done when I have some free time and have a go at beating it. If I even have the skill to, that is. And according to what I've read online, there's yet another bonus mode to play after beating Zangyo mode, meaning you can play this game through three whole times and have a totally unique experience on each playthrough. This is some next level replayability and adds a lot of content to the game. As if this wasn't already enough shit to do post-game, Blaster also has 10 achievements to unlock. The game doesn't actually tell you how to get them, but I looked them up online and I'll tell you one thing. They are definitely not for the faint of heart. If you're a hardcore completionist, these are going to add a ton more game time for you. All up, Kero Blaster costs just 10 bucks on Steam, which for the amount of gameplay it provides is a pretty decent price point. Your wallet feeling a bit light? Kero Blaster has two free demos called Pink Hour and Pink Heaven, where you play as the pink office worker character from the main game. Both of these are really short, but the gameplay is just as fun as the main game, and these demo games even have their own hard modes that you can unlock by beating them once normally. And of course, how could I forget, Cave Story, the game that preceded this one and is widely considered to be even better, is absolutely free to download and play in its entirety. As for how I score Kero Blaster, I'm gonna go ahead and give it four and a half stars for being a short and simple game with fantastic gameplay, impeccable design, and enormous replay value. So even if you're not normally a platformer person, do yourself a favor and give Kero Blaster or even Cave Story a go. They may be a little challenging if you're less experienced with the genre, but I consider both of them to be among the best games I've ever played. Naturally, you'll find the links to Kero Blaster, Cave Story, and the Pink Hour and Pink Heaven demos in the description. Thanks again for tuning in, and don't forget to subscribe.